Okay, we're recording now. <laughs> Hi, hello, it's Lindsay from UK Hypnosis Convention again, and today I'm with Jimmy Petruti. Hi, Jimmy. <laughs> Hi, Lindsay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Jimmy's a, a high performance coach, he's a hypnotherapist, NLP trainer, best selling author, and, and a lot more. Jimmy is going to be presenting a one hour session on the Saturday at uh, quarter to three to quarter to four, which is hypnotherapy for sports performance and a one day full day workshop on Monday the 11th of November which is entitled Hypnotherapy and Cognitive Techniques for Stress Management in Business and Sport. Hi Jimmy and thank you for joining us again. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what we can expect from your presentation and in particular your workshop? Absolutely yeah. and thank you for having me on the show and, and thank you for uh, having me as a speaker at the convention. I really enjoyed Last year was fantastic, and I'm looking forward to this year as well. There's a lot of great speakers, and it's a great opportunity for myself to convey some information I've accumulated over many, many years. So uh, my own background in hypnosis anyway starts as a 17-year-old, and I would look for a coach to help me athletically to improve my physical performance. Little did I know this guy had a background in hypnosis and psychology, and he would help me immensely overcome many limiting beliefs I had about myself and you know, growing up I had very severe asthma and I was a late developer as well uh, physically and, and that led to challenges trying to play sport at the highest level I possibly could so I found this guy who helped me a lot and overcome many of the limiting beliefs I had and eventually I would go on and um, you know travel the world and, and sort of participate in sport uh, but ultimately, in the end, it would take me to academia. And I signed up for a course at Loughborough University in, in the UK at 23. I was called a mature age student. <laughs> That's called me now. It's called Sports Performance Conditioning, the course. And that was sort of the, the road into academia for me um, because it sort of gave me that sort of first for, for knowledge. So I had done training in hypnosis and NLP previously I'd been to a Tony Robbins seminar at 19 years of age I wanted to see what was all what you know what he was doing um, but I didn't really have the former academia so I signed up for the sports performance conditioning and I was never really academic I really struggled at school because my mum was really ill my dad got injured and I had to leave school at least not leave school but I had to work as a 15 year old so my academic suffered and when I got a taste for it and love for it really it really gave me a taste for learning more. And, and I would sort of go on a journey and study at various prestigious universities, uh, particularly in the UK. And I'm still studying now. I've gone back into learning again at you know, the prestigious uh, King's College in London. And the reason being is because I think we're, we're, we're always learning and I'm a lifelong learner. I've been very fortunate with some great mentors. And one of my biggest influences in hypnosis is uh, Dr. Jeff Zeig in Arizona, who took on the Ericsson Foundation. And whilst I've trained in different types of hypnosis so to speak and many of the modalities uh, i'd say jeff has had probably the biggest impact on me personally in terms of the the way he does things it, it works for me uh, and whilst i sort of got to a level of psychology at postgraduate level i felt psychology uh, was a bit too pathology for me um, and i sort of decided to go back down the the, the path of hypnosis and, and various modalities mindfulness which has an evidence base too by the mm. way um and many other modalities to um to, to to improve myself and go forward and i think what's happened is because i've written a number of books and and probably see in the background um in nlp the, the stigma between me and nlp and sport and, and the reason being is that i work with so many big sporting establishments and high profile athletes in sport and that gave me a lot of media and publicity. And I sort of literally was stigmatized. That's the, the NLP sports. The sports guy. <laughs> I've got a heavier science base and hypnosis uh, based than NLP. But I have obviously studied NLP for a very long time too and deliver it in training too. I don't believe any model is, is panacea. I don't think that, you know, it's one size fits all. I'm very holistic, not reductionistic. And I really believe that, you know, you've got to find the perfect fit for the person you're working with. And that sort of gives the, the audience a bit of an insight into, into me. Um, so hopefully it gives them a bit of a flavor in terms of you know, what I do, how I go about doing things. 
Yeah, excellent. So your your one hour one is is um, which on the Saturday is is specifically for sports performance, but presumably that will cover other things as well. Yeah, it is, and, and these principles can be transferred to many other areas too. And, and these principles can be transferred to business, to life in general. And to give you an example and to illustrate um, to the audience, uh, one of my clients going back a few years ago, uh, she was a young girl participating in trampolining at the very highest level. Now she gave up trampolining because one of her colleagues bouncing on a trampoline had burst their leg. Mm -hmm. And in the event of her colleague bursting her leg, it then would manifest in, in a schema uh, in an association in her own mind. And she just refused to participate anymore. Her mum had taken her to many different people. Well, so she told me anyway, to help her overcome this barrier. I tend to be last chance to lose. Um, just like in football teams, they always come to me when they're losing. I never get teams who are winning saying, can you come along? It'd be a refreshing change to get a winning team come to me. But it's always, can you turn our fortunes around? Yeah. Um, so she asked me if I could work with her. And I said, well, you know, we can, we can talk. And, and like I always do consultation, I thought, okay, uh, I, can, I can give her uh, some insights into what I do and, and some techniques that we can work with. We can reappraise the situation and do uh, regressive techniques, but also do visualization and peak mental state exercises going forward. And cutting a long story short, eventually she would partake back in trampoline again. It was actually in, in, in a newspaper and, and it was well documented, albeit I don't think she said too much about the work I did, um, probably down to confidentiality, who knows, but equally in saying that her mum did send me a text when she was performing, I think it was the British Championships and said, well, I really want to thank you. My daughter's just won silver. I'm pretty sure it was British Championships, if I recall, it was a long time ago now. And I'm not putting a success down to me um, because I see myself as being the facilitator. But that's to give the, the audience an illustration of how these events in our life shape our reality to a certain extent. And sometimes, you know, it can take a moment of turbulence in a plane. It can take a bad event in a sporting uh, organization. It can take a, a bad business deal and it puts yeah. us up for life. And the analogy I've used and used many times, and people probably bored of me using it, um, is how important psychosocial techniques are. And, and an illustration of that is the film A Christmas Carol, Scrooge, and, and he's a guy who, um, if people haven't watched the film, um, they can go ahead and watch it. Well, a few months will be Christmas time. But the point being, he's the guy that he, you know, he's, he's, he's known as Scrooge. And, but if you sort of trace back in his life, early on in his life, there's an event that shapes his reality. He was going to get engaged and the engagement breaks off and he ends up um, surrounding himself, suppressing his feelings through mm. work. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing, but eventually what happens is sort of, he sees work as the outlet, as the coping strategy. He's in control of that. And even though he wants to socialize, he wants to, you know, be amongst it all, he kind of is afraid of doing that and, and, and sort of fear governs his life. And it wasn't until he gets a, a visit from his, his business partner, I think it was Jacob Marley. Um, but also, and it's almost like a, a metaphor for hypnosis because he got, goes to the past, he goes to the past and then he goes to the future. And, and the future has this, startle realization of what life will be like if he carries on the way he is and he doesn't like that but the only place you can change is in the now so mm. you can hypothesize about the future you can focus on the past but the reality is that in a gestalt sort of way the only time you can change is the now and the reality is that in the morning he does change and he's not sure if it's real or not if it's just a dream but it doesn't really matter because yeah. he changes and he's, he changes the identity so through this experience cutting a long story short is his identity changes through this experience and for me creating experiences for people to stimulate realizations at a level of identity and and our beliefs and his beliefs about himself the world and others changes but equally his identity how one defines who they are impacts their behavior and for me it's a perfect illustration of how experiential methods whatever they are whatever modality you practice experience can have a really profound effect in changing someone's reality yeah. and that's what i want to convey in the seminar and after i did the seminar last year a lot of people had said to me can you do a workshop and i thought okay i'd love to do a workshop and just elongate it yeah. and bring in cognitive strategies because reappraisal is really important and i think things like cbt are really useful for reappraisal because you know the the, the model itself um the abc model we have a perception of the event 
and that influences our thought process and our thought process influences our emotions, our behavior, our physiology. And this is always sort of in a mesh and you can sort of separate that mesh. And I think combining that with hypnosis at a more subconscious receptive level, that sort of alpha uh, theta state that we can go into the sort of state where we wake up in the morning or we're going to bed at night, we, we're more receptive. And I think it can really solidify the belief. And I mentioned before that if you took a 20 meter, uh, 10 meter bridge, say a half a foot off the ground, you know, two meters wide. So it's perfectly safe to walk across, you would think, uh, in, in nice conditions. If one had to walk across to pick up a bag of money, which they were entitled to, they'd have no reservation to, to do that. Um, do you, it, precisely, so would I. I'd sprint across, believe it or not. Very often seen you sprinting anymore. But the point being is that if you elongate the, the, the bridge to, to um, 10,000 meters high, people are going to be reluctant to do that because I think all of a sudden the permutations and, you know, rightly so, but equally if the conditions were the same, the permutations then, you know, yeah. even though there's a hundred percent chance just about you're not going to fall um, or no more chance you're going to fall if it's so high, you're still thinking permutation. What if I fall and the land of what if, and yeah. Please don't walk across the bridge if you're watching the the, the no. audience. I'm not planning on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the audience, I'm not suggesting you sort of you walk across a high bridge. But the point being is to illustrate how our our fear can govern our mind. And 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 what I want to sort of do on the workshop, which I don't get as much time on the seminar to do, is to illustrate how human beings were goal directed. You know, irrespective whether we set a goal or not. Uh, consciously, we, we are goal orientated. And I think for me, fear can run our life, you know, and, and rather than suppress the fear, because there's a lot of evidence out there, suppressing fear is only useful in the short term. Long term, it's going to come and get you, mm. you know, it's not going to do you any favors, it sort of festers in the, in the primal structure of the brain. So for me, hypnosis is a great way to, a gateway to get into the primal structure of the brain, to access the limbic system. And, and help with these changes. So the point being is that, you know, creating experience for people, because logically, we know the answers. Logically, well, the bridge is the same yeah, exactly. distance. But the irony is we don't think logically. It's a, it's a pro that battle leads with the primal brain, the, 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 the frontal cortex, the newer brain. And when you sort of, the two grapple, the one that's going to generally win is the primal brain because it's been evolving for so long from you know basic organism millions of years ago um, and aversion. And for me, rather than suppressing the fear, facing up to it and saying, okay, um, where the mindfulness comes in is perhaps I don't need to change at the moment. I can just be with whatever it is. It's like stubbing a toe or stubbing our funny bone where let it be, let it pass. But equally appraisal is really useful but the appraisal has got to be meaningful for the person doing the reappraising um so for example you know if you were so high on the bridge um your reappraisal has got to be in accordance to your values and, and your beliefs in the sense that if all of a sudden someone said one of your children or your family's in danger you then think well actually i'm going to go across you're not going to so, think about it then are you? So it's one thing appraising and reappraising and the evidence also suggests that the reappraisal is far more effective when it's in accordance to your values, what's important to you. And the more intrinsic it is, the more chance you've got of doing it. So these are things that you sort of, you can't teach in a book. It's, 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 it's being practical, being there are really useful. And I like to think that over 20 something years of, of my journey, I've got a lot to offer people who come along and we can look at these things like reappraising, we can look at things that, you know, understanding our emotions, the evolution of the brain or the nervous system and the way that works. And people understanding how, they don't have to be an expert how the brain works, but have a basic understanding or reinforce the knowledge they've got. So then they know why we do the technique. So we're not plucking them out of the sky and thinking, well, I'll do this for that. And yeah. how we tailor it too. And that's really important when you, you tailor a technique for the individual, because everyone is unique. You're 86 billion neurons and, and, and trillions of cells. And I think for me, where a lot of people in, in coaching um, and, and therapy exhaust themselves is that sort of belief that they're the all powerful, mighty one. They're going to say something and it's going to change. And there's loads of self-help books because 
you could buy a self-help book for self-help books these days. They're all yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah, the, idea is that the, the, the idea is how it can facilitate an experience for people. And a couple of examples I'll use, because time is of the essence, that I've done that of, of many, many years and to illustrate that it's not just about sport because I've worked in sport and people can do the, the research and see I've worked at the very highest level with some of the best athletes in the world and sporting teams. And I'd like to think I've played my little part in turning their fortunes around. Um, but they can check it out. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and social media. They, they write things and, and it's very kind of them to, to write the influence I've had on them. Um, so from, from the point of view of a couple of examples of how this works in, 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 in real life, so to speak, and not just sport, is I had a client a few years ago who wanted to start presenting again. And she had a really bad experience. And she used to work in offending institutions. And she apparently, from what she told me, had been attacked in one of the offending institutions and, you know, by a man or a male or, or was threatened. Hmm. So you got the amygdala then, um, the, the, the amygdala, the part of the brain, the primal brain, um, has created an aversive experience where next time she's in a situation that implicitly even reminds of that subconsciously, yeah. Aversion. So the amygdala in action um, is, is basically like, for example, many years ago, I was walking down the street after school and this guy came out and started waving a knife at me um, and it, where I was safe. I, I got away, um, but equally, I got home, told my friends and family, like, what's all the fuss about type thing? But even the, follow, the following day, I caught a bus and it wasn't until a week later, I decided to walk down the street again. As I'm walking down the street, I could still see him there. I could mm-hmm. still hear him and feel him. I was still deliberating. Should I have hit him? Should I have ran? Should I have you know, done whatever. He wasn't there. And that's the, the amygdala, because there's one structure on the side, in action. So the point being where she was concerned, she was safe to speak in no danger, um, but equally that aversion she built around speaking. Yeah, it was um, nice. yeah. Precisely. So I, she sort of seeked out help and nothing seemed to work. And once again, I'm last chance to Lou. And what I did with her is I, I created an experience with her. I said to her, okay, um, join martial arts. Now, why martial arts? Because I thought in a martial arts club, you are around men who've got self-control. And if you can be around men that have got self-control, it can peel away at the scheme and create a new association experientially. But if you don't want to be there, then, then leave. I don't believe in sink or swim. I believe in extending the comfort zone. Hmm. Um, and I said, if you go, if you're comfortable there, then, then go ahead. Um, so it wasn't joining the martial arts club to go back and beat the people up who's scared. <laughs> precise, so, and, and she went there and, and through going there, she built the new neural association to being in an environment until eventually I said, well, why don't you join a speaking group? Um, and she joined the group and, and, you know, in the space of a few weeks and we'd done interventions in between, um, some of the interventions I'm going to cover or well, pretty much all of them on the one day workshop. Um, and eventually after a few weeks, she started delivering again. And, and that's amazing. And, and, but equally in saying that, um, you know, as I've mentioned before, um, you know, someone who'd spoken highly of me because she was in a situation where she had very severe anxiety. Now she'd come to me for um, assistance. Her parents actually approached me. They knew of me um, because I think she had some relatives in the world of football, so to speak. And that's why you go see that guy. Um, who does his voodoo. <laughs> they call me voodoo, oh. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to break that stigma, by the way. But, you know, I, I can take the banter as you do. And, and, and so it's one of them. But anyway, she comes along to me and, and she hadn't left the house practically for a few years, apparently. Or so she told me anyway. So the parents said, and she'd tried. She'd, been, she'd gone through the system, Lindsay, you know, and she was seeing a CBT. And I'm not dismissing CBT. I've done a lot of studies and written a manual that can see in the area too. And I've delivered components of it to staff in care homes and I think it's really useful and cover some on the on the seminar but the reality is that sometimes you know people look for help and the help they get is through the system is through the the nice guidelines which I won't go into and whilst they're useful and 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 great um, I suppose some people are going to say well they don't get the treatment of their choice which you know is good and bad without going into that (laughs) and getting contentions Um, I, I out of professional courtesy I phoned a therapist and said are you okay with me working with the young girl? And she said, well, it's entirely up to her. So I had to tell the young girl what the ramifications could be. I said, if you work with me, they may not allow you back in the system, the NHS in the UK, I don't know. Uh, and she said, well, I've been down this, you know, wild goose chase for three or four years now. I don't feel I'm getting any better. Uh, I want to give it a go. So, okay. I said, well, give it a go. I said, before you do that, I want to make sure there's no organic conditions or anything else that could be, uh, affecting anxiety because anxiety is quite complex and there's many anxiety disorders and there's a spectrum 
um, so on and so forth. And when I say organic disorders, obviously thyroid or tumor or whatever, um, because I'm not medical, I'm not, you know, biological yeah. in that respect. But, you know, she assured me that she'd been through many tests because she had fibromyalgia as well. Um, and ironically, after a few weeks of working with her, I set her a target of going to a party. And people said, well, you know, so it's a big chance you're taking. But I said, I'll, I'll support her through the process because I felt if we could get through that, um, it would break a belief barrier. Uh, and she actually went. And she enjoyed herself. And not long after that, she got her life back. And now she has her life back. Um, and the parents are indebted to the work I did and, and see me, um, you know, regularly for other things and, and mm. so on and so forth. But I use that story to show that, you know, ironically, too, her consultant is one of the top in the country uh, for uh, the condition she was being treated for that she didn't come to see me for, a separate condition, had wrote to me and he was amazed. And his secretary wrote to me and said, what did you do? Um, because they were sort of gobsmacked. And, and I said, well, you know what? I'm more than happy for, for me to, to do a, a, a workshop or invite you to one of my workshops to see what I did, because yeah. I don't think I did anything. I facilitated. Um, but I don't think that took me up on that. But, you know, that's another story for another day. I, I use that illustration because, you know, people sort of see me as, as sport, but ironically, all the work I do is outside sport. It's mm. in business and, and also subclinical uh, as well. And I also work with people who've got clinical, as long as the person they're seeing clinically is happy yeah. for me to do the work that I, I do. And yeah. that's purely because obviously, you know, we know uh, mental health is very complex and things like depression are on a spectrum and anxiety is on a spectrum from sub fresh or sub clinic all the way to treatment resistant and sort of, you know, depending on what their goal is and, um, and, and, and what their expectations are from me, then I can sort of perhaps what we've them, yeah. and just in doubt, if I'm ever in doubt, I always say, if they see the clinician, you know, what are their thoughts? Um, or equally, if they haven't seen a clinician, I always say, well, perhaps exactly. yeah. you see a clinical expert in that area, um, you know, because there's a fine line also in performance and, and clinical as well, Lindsay, you know, and in sport, especially because you always look at that sort of fine line, mm. um, you know, uh, between that sort of performance goal well, I want to score 20 goals this season. Well, I'm anxious about that big football game. And also, is it something that sort of needs, you know, clinical support? And, and yeah. I think for me, the advantage of having, you know, one foot in the science camp, one foot in the spiritual camp, or sort of somewhere in between, it's quite useful um, to have accumulated that knowledge. Uh, and all, all, you know, although I didn't pursue a career in psychology, um, you know, uh, having a postgraduate level qualification in that area and continue my studies in, in, in neuroscience, which originally the science I was studying is more sports related. Mm. Now it's far more mental health is quite useful to sort of, okay, so, well, you know, perhaps yeah. see that person and so on yeah. and so forth. But yeah, you know, I've studied for 20 something yeah. years, if not more, I believe in what I do because I have like many people in our field applied it to themselves originally. Mm. Um, so I really believe in, 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 in what I do um, and I really enjoy working with people uh, across a broad range of areas. It's yeah. a buzz and, and I'm really excited about presenting at the conference because I thought last year was fantastic. You know, Nick last year did an amazing job. I really enjoyed myself there. I went and watched other people speak. Mm. And I love the atmosphere too because there's no big egos like you do get at some conferences, not all of them, but there are some that I won't mention I've been to. Um, not necessarily hypnosis. I speak at other conferences and other modalities too. Mm. Yeah, you, do, you do get that. Um, but I thought here, everyone was so down to earth. We had a it's ball. It's a great event, isn't it? Yeah, it we really is. enjoyed ourselves. And, yeah. and, but there's some great professionals. And this year, mm. I looked at the lineup and I think the, 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 the science base for me really excites me because um, I love learning from, from all spectrums. I think people, you know, don't necessarily have the, you know, the science base and great people who uh, have learned in different ways. Um, but I like getting a, a balance of both, you know, yeah, quoting exactly. from the literature is really important for, to me because I've always had that sort of science based, but also anecdote uh, for me uh, is really important too, because that sort of gives us that sort of mix of so science. It's taken us to the edge of a pier, but there's yeah. a notion that we don't know as well. And sometimes you've got to sort of just be with it and think, you know what, you know, there, there's an irony and I've talked about this irony in my journey in mindfulness that some of these concepts have been around for four or 5,000 years 
And now they're trying to turn it secular and have turned it secular Western science. It's almost sometimes losing the essence. It's like almost like, well, actually, you know what? You know, who are you to tell, you know, 4,000 years of, you know, uh, you know, what derives from Buddhism, that a, a way of not, not being it. And there's almost an R in there. And I love the work of some of the, the scientists, by the way, and I think it's important to do that. Uh, but equally, I think we've got to be we've got to be mindful too to sort of realize that that these things have been around. Some of the concepts in CBT have been around for you know yeah, Greek no. philosophers and and hypnosis as well. It's, it's been around you know for thousands of years in in the context of the way well, it's been practiced. Yeah. So I think we've got to pay a lot of respect for people who have their own way of doing things, and 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 we can all you know share off each other. So yeah. I'm really excited and I'm really pleased to be doing the yeah. the really? seminar as well as the actual. Uh, workshop too so yeah we're really pleased to have you so i'll just remind everyone that your um your seminar the one hour one hypnotherapy for sports performances on saturday the 9th of november and that's um uh, in the richmond room quarter to three to quarter to four and the workshop tickets are on sale from our website um on monday the 11th hypnotherapy and cognitive techniques for stress management in business and sport but as jimmy's explained so much more as well <laughs> It is absolutely, and I can see the curriculum. It's on the actual uh, website too, on the on the on the hypnosis convention website. They can see the curriculum. If they any if they have any questions about the curriculum, they can email me. I also give them, provide them with a manual too, and no extra cost. Once they book on, they've got a manual as well that they can work through too, and I also provide them with a, a number of learning resources afterwards too. And I also give them. Uh, internal certificate to say they've attended by email. So I'll give them an internal certificate to say they've attended by email. And thereafter, I give them many, many resources to, to go away because I truly believe in lifelong learning. And also for me, it's a sort of workshop where it's a little bit different to, you know, the, the sort of people go to the, the sort of those motivational seminars, which are quite useful. You know, I've been to many myself and you know, I like the likes of the Tony Robbins, really, really good. But I, I, what I do here is I give you the, the practical techniques for you to use based in your remit. And I break things down really clearly, how you can combine things like CBT, mindfulness, hypnosis as well. So, and other modalities I've started over the years too. And I also give you like resource manual. And the resource manuals are, are really good because they've got checklists, they're linked to videos as well. And you can take your time, um, you know, and sometimes what happens is that you don't, you know, you, you learn what you need to learn, but equally a year or two later, three years later, back, you, think. Yeah. Yeah, you sort of go back yeah. and you've always got that. So, you know, Excellent. it's really great value. It really is. And, and, you know, they get the manual too and the internal study get too uh, as well. And, and you know, it's, it's going to be a fantastic day as well. And, and it's right. more about learning the techniques and then applying it. And, you know, they're very transferable to sport, to business, life in general, oh. life's not easy. Um, you know, life, we've got many challenges and a lot of the work I've done in business is around intrinsic and, and we sort of reflecting uh, on, on the work in business for me I've done is intrinsically and sort of to close, to give people an illustration, to sort of give an idea of how this applies to business. Many years ago, Lindsay, when I first started working in business, um, this is a long time ago now, before I wrote the, the best-selling book in business and the irony was that I went into this business, this company, and I said to them, and I didn't, I, I came from a background in therapy and sport. I didn't know a great deal about business, um, but I didn't know how to sort of motivate people and get the best out of people. And I said, what do you want to improve? I'm just curious to know what you want to improve. They said, we want to improve the KPIs. Truth be told, I didn't know what a KPI was back then. I know what they are now. So I went home, I studied them. I thought, well, I used my, my knowledge in psychology. I said, well, KPI is being a key performance indicator is quite extrinsic. It's an extrinsic motivation. I compared it to sport where you've got a league table. You've got um, yeah. variables that you can't uh, control. You can affect, you can't control. You can't control the league table in sport, in football, in golf. What you can do is control your performance. So I went back and I studied the extension and said, that because whilst it's really important, you need a, a table in golf, you need a table in sport to know what you're up to. But internally, what you can control is the variables like your motivation, your enthusiasm. So I, I, I then used, I looked at the, 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 the five factor model, which is a science-based model. Other models I could find in psychometric. And I sort of looked at them and thought, well, what makes a good member of staff? What makes a good person? And I, you know, what influences people's behavior? You got environment, you got genetic, 
experience. I thought, what can I possibly do to get the best out of people? So I racked my head and I came back the next day and said, I've got an idea for you. It's called a HPI. He goes, what in the world is a HPI? I said, I don't know. I've just made it up. But it's the human performance indicator. I said, what makes a good, we sort of talk about what makes a good member of staff, you know, and what we could control. I said, let's focus on internal attribution rather than external attribution. And if you can get the best out of people on a scale of one to 10 with 10 being high at a nine, because life is going to very challenging. People go through divorces, breakups, problems, you know, away from work. And how you put your game head is key. And I really focused on the game head. And I thought, let's create experiences for people that, and give them the knowledge, the yeah. psych education to, to put their game head on uh, when they get into work in the morning. So they're enthusiastic and motivated. It's the same about as you do a good thing or, you know, something half go in they give you a best shot whatever's going on in your life and i use the principles from sport as well and i had big success in that organization and that was sort of the blueprint man about really focusing on controllable variables and yeah. that's what the work is all about the work's just about teaching people to control controllable variables and and focus on those and you know get the best out of people going forward so that's Fantastic. pretty much all I've got to say, unless anyone's got any questions, they can email me, comments, questions, or whatever. They, you know, I'll do the best I can. Perfect. So, yeah. So we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you in November when you'll have your game head on. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm buzzing. I really head. am. And I looked at the lineup and I thought, you know what? Uh, I looked at when I'm speaking. I looked at people speaking. Obviously, I can't attend another talk when I'm speaking. But I looked at the lineup. But you can you can be sure I'm going to be you know drifting in, sitting in the back there of other people's <laughs> talks. And there's so many great speakers and. You know, you walk away from this um, convention and certainly many conventions and, and certainly the one I went last year and the, the speakers this year are amazing. And you walk away from it with so many new ideas, Fantastic. so many great learnings. And, you know, I've been in this field for so long. And, um, you know, sometimes people will see me sitting in the back of a, a seminar or a convention saying, well, you know, you've been studying for so many years. Look, you're always learning. I don't care who you are. I don't care how many titles you got, you know, to, to your name. I think for me, it's a lifelong. And even if you just reinforce the learning, yeah, and see it yeah. from someone else's perspective, it's, it's, it's job done. And for me, you go in there, you learn. And the value is incredible too, by the way, the actual cost to, to come on board. And I think for me, for what you get, uh, it truly is amazing. When you think about what it costs to go to university, when you yes. think about what it costs to go to college and, and so on and so forth. And that's undermining. I've studied at uni and still do now. <laughs> It's expensive though, isn't it? Precisely. But, but what you get and the value is just difficult to quantify because if you take one learning and it makes a big difference to your life and you help a client get that job, you help someone, you know, be the best they can be in sport, you help that team win a penalty shootout, then what value do you put on that? And for me, when I started my journey and, and people said to me, well, why are you investing in, in these areas? I think the biggest value I've got out of it is, is, is when I get the text from, say, a family member and very rarely I do it with my family because the identity you want to keep it as it is. But the value of, you know, when you do get the chance to sort of help yeah. someone in your family, you know, with an exam or, you know, we've, 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 we've professionally for an interview is phenomenal, but also, you know, the buzz you get when you sort of learn something and then applied it to a huge sporting context, um, you know, a, a business situation or helping, like I said earlier, the, the, the young girl um, get a life back on track yeah. or, or, or that woman presents again and get back into work again. The value around that for me is absolutely phenomenal. So I want to share those experiences and, and I look forward to, to seeing you and, and, and Adam and everybody else and, and other speakers. And yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thanks Steve. very much. We will see you Thank in you. November. We'll look Thank forward you. To it. Look forward to it. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>